Welcome back. I want to take a quick second to tell you about our sponsor of today's episode of North American Deer Talk, CNE Wildlife Products. CNE Wildlife is a trusted leader in biotechnology for the cervid industry. They offer micro encapsulated bacteria products that are research supported through Texas Tech University. With more than 30 years of experience and commitment to all natural probiotics, this product line continues to be a mainstay in herd management programs across North America. And the reason is simple. They are passionate about the cervid industry. They have products for elk, whitetail, muleys, red deer, and more. With products ranging from Fawn Paste and Electromax to Guardian Plus, Whitetail Energy Pack, Jumpstart, or their ever popular Top Score Extreme, they just flat out work. We've been a CNE Wildlife product user for more than 15 years. To learn more about CNE Wildlife, check out episode 54 of North American Deer Talk, a probiotics masterclass with CNE owner Sadie Horrocks, and give her a call today to start using the products we do here. Hey, it's the Deer Wizard, host of North American Deer Talk. I want to tell you about a great new advertising and research platform that we've developed for you, CWDbreeding.com. You know, as the deer industry continues to mature and develop around chronic waste and disease and its known genetic heritability, resources like CWDbreeding.com become essential tools for deer managers across the country making decisions about their herds. I really wanted a platform that excelled at hosting GBV and codon markers in a filterable and searchable manner, but I also wanted to have high quality pictures, videos, ages, scores, NADAR numbers, and a whole host of other information to go along with that. This database puts everything in one easy to find location and allows you to access the industry's greatest genetic resources. I look forward to seeing all the great bucks that people have to offer in one easy to find location, cwdbreeding.com. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of North American Deer Talk. This is episode 73. If you listened to the last show, you know I was talking about the pillars of success. Well, if you're watching on the stream, boom, got the deer tracking mag. Uh, before we get into the uh, topic of the show today, I just want to take a quick opportunity to, you know, thank you all for listening. I appreciate it. Um, you know, one of the things I was thinking about is, is generally speaking, and uh, I, I'm guilty of this as well, is, you know, we don't share out um, content that helps kind of, you know, support industry and, and things like that. And I think some of the shows that we do... Um, they do indeed do that. And, you know, I'd greatly appreciate the support and you guys sharing this out to people, even just a simple like on the video. Uh, those things mean a lot to me. It also helps us with our reach. So, you know, if we can um, kind of coalesce around some of these, um, you know, some of these shows and some of the messaging that we do, uh, I, I, I try to be a, a good representative voice for uh, the industry. And certainly if you think you are that person, please come on the show. Um, I want to keep building this platform out, uh, not for myself, but for all of you. So, uh, if you have something to say and you think it's, um, something that's worthwhile, um, just send me an email or something like that. And we'll, you know, we'll try to put a show together. Uh, I can't, I can't guarantee that I'll I'll have everybody on, um, but, you know, or if you know someone that has a compelling story um, that you think needs told and, um, you know, we can make that happen, then let's do that. Um, I, I think that's a good thing. So I'm going to continue to work on, on interviews again today. You're stuck with just me, uh, but we are going to cover a good topic um, relating around animal health. So... In the last episode, I talked about an article that I uh, contributed to the uh, deer tracking magazine. Well, I said that I wasn't going to cover uh, that prior to the publication. Well, I did just get my copy. Again, shout out to the Barks family up in Canada. Um, check out this mag. Right at the top, it says uh, 25 years as an independent deer industry research. 25 years. That's a long time. Um, 
this is the spring summer um episode or episode excuse me yeah it's an episode uh magazine it's got um it's got some some good analysis analysis in there uh there's a top 30 recap which is uh pretty detailed and interesting uh that you should you should take a look at and um there's also a an article in there that we did again called the pillars of success so uh with that said i want to work through that article with you guys today um if you want to read that get yourself a subscription to deer tracking uh what does it say six six ninety five um i forget what their yearly is um i don't know it's in the twenty dollar range or thirty dollar range you get you know four copies or something like that um well worth the the uh the value that's provided in there and not only that it's it's entertaining so if you're um into deer like i know many of you are and and that kind of consumes your your life and your lifestyle uh there's not a better magazine uh today than than deer tracking so um check that out it's deertracking.com anyway mm -hmm. on to uh this article so when i when i first thought about this and you know, I want, I, I enjoy, I enjoy doing the kind of the health aspect of things. My favorite thing is, is genetics, um, because it's more of a, it's more of a, an unknown, uh, working with genetics, uh, considering that, 50% uh, of the, uh, animals that we have to assess antler quality is, uh, in the female category and does not grow these antlers and oh by the way there's only two genders so like let's just we got bucks and we got does so that's what we talk about here we talk about bucks and does um and not that antlers are the only thing we read for because they're certainly not and it's actually a recipe for disaster in my eyes just breeding for antlers um but that is the uh most unique kind of quality uh trait that uh, it's difficult to breed for. Anyway, so the the health end of things is kind of uh, my second my second passion, and then as I uh, go further and further into my uh, experience with deer, uh, it continues to become I don't want to say easier, but certainly over the past few years, um, outside of the the regulatory impacts of uh, chronic wasting disease. Um, it, it's, it's become a little easier for me, um, and more enjoyable to, to raise deer than, you know, the first call it 20 years. Um, not that I, I didn't have lots of fun and that, that experience has certainly shaped me and molded me, uh, into becoming a, a better manager of these animals. Um, the, the health aspect is, is kind of what I do for a living. So, um, you know, Servant Solutions is obviously the, uh, you know, the impetus of this, uh, this show, this North American Deer Talk show that we have. Uh, and, and it's just, it's part of my, it's part of my living, um, working on these, these kind of health related ideas and concepts. Um, I, I just, it's, it's something that, that I enjoy. And obviously it's incredibly important. Um, we do tend to overcomplicate things, I think. And uh, I thought that this particular article was a, a really kind of simple explanation of um, kind of the low hanging fruit or the three easy things that we can look at that help greatly improve the overall health of our herd. Uh, so we're going to run through those today. Um, I got the article in front of me on the screen. Uh, it's again, we're going to work through it. And uh, as I had mentioned before, I think we're going to do I'll try to do um a show on each one of these pillars. So uh, I start off by saying that I'm not a veterinarian. I don't have any formal education in deer management, and I am pretty stubborn. Does that sound familiar to you guys? Yeah, it sure does. Uh, that's pretty much every deer farmer and rancher I know. Now, we, we cut our teeth on, you know, our experiences, and, and we try to learn from them. So when I reflect on on my journey that I have, and I know that many have taken, I can't help but wonder 
why we choose to reinvent the wheel when it comes to raising deer. People have propagated livestock for thousands of years. And in today's world of limitless technology, you would think that we'd have the resources available to use on our path. Now I'm coming into my 24th year of, uh, I call it uh, deer world or real world education. And I just wanted to share some of the things that I feel are the pillars of success. And this is specifically relating to the uh, general animal health. So this is a big picture look. Uh, we're not going to get into too much nuanced detail, although I may go off the rails on, on some of this, but we'll, we'll try to keep it um, kind of uh, high level. And, and this is really, and this is key, this is really what separates um, those that are good to those that are great. And I think if we simply look at you know, cattle, sheep, goats, other livestock industries, that's where we can get our recipe. So I like to try to adapt these ideas and concepts to fit uh, our deer operations. And then I think we can be successful. So pillar one, let's face it, you probably have too many deer. I think this is true for the overwhelming majority of the people that uh, I I talk with it is, uh, and and it's tough to say you know what that appropriate level is, but I think generally speaking, you know, too many people have too many deer. So why do we feel the need to cram so many animals in a in a confined space? As time moves on, uh, I've I've come to realize that it it really is. Um, the limiting number of deer on any given pasture that is the most important thing to maintaining healthy animals. Healthy animals are a definition of success. And for the vast majority of us, creating fawns, which is the next generation, is the most profitable way to extract that income from our farms. So what's a good starting point for answering uh, the question of how many deer is too many? That's the key. How many deer is too many? Well, uh, when I look at it, I look at mortality and morbidity rates, um, mortality being death, morbidity being sickness, and, and it's kind of an easy and known calculation. So the animals that express this the most are the fawns. Well, why is that? It's because when they enter the world, they have a very naive immune system, and generally speaking, they have the highest chance of getting sick and or dying. So as a rule of thumb, I like to see four to six adult does per acre pre-fawning on fresh, if at all possible, winter rested pastures or at least minimally impacted pasture. Um, you know, you can start with higher animal numbers, but my experience just has led me to a place where if I violate those rules, I end up paying the price. So that's the kind of general overarching uh, view that I take on pen density and its importance. So four to six adults per acre, um, and that's always uh, pre-fawning. If you can get fresh and, and rested pasture, that's awesome. If not, um, I, I'd, I'd still try to maintain that space. And what that has provided me when I adhere to that strictly is almost no death and very minimal, um, you know, morbidity rates through our, our animals. So again, high level look at pillar one, pen density. Pillar two, vaccination program. I know this is coming from the guy that sells vaccines. I do sell vaccines. Um, but I wanna share just a, a quick story with you and you can draw your own conclusions from it. So. Uh, for the first 10 years, I was kind of like an anti-vax kind of guy. Uh, I said things like, they're deer, they live in the wild, they're just fine, right? Or my favorite was, my deer don't get sick much, and if they do, I just give them some, some meds, right? And I think a lot of us are like, hey, we just deal with sick animals and, and we treat them. Uh, as time kind of went on and I had more animals on the same piece of ground for years and years, my bacterial problems continued to kind of slowly grow along with my herd inventory. So as herd inventory uh, increased, it also increased the bacterial problems that I experienced in these animals. So I decided to add some commercial uh, cattle vaccines to my health program, uh, which at that point really wasn't well defined. And I was less than satisfied with the results. 
So I kept saying to myself, uh, I wonder why these vaccines don't work. Such and such farmer uh, with way more experience than myself uh, uses them, told me they work great. I, as a, uh, a method or a simple review with my herd vet, about the coverage of these uh, specific vaccines, it just simply didn't match up with the bacteria that we were finding in our necropsy reports. And this was done through sampling and diagnostics. Um, and that's that's a whole other can of worms, the sampling and diagnostic parts. But um, that left us in a place to say, you know, what options are left for us knowing that the commercial vaccines are not providing the adequate coverage for the most common bacteria found? So enter autogenous biologics. What is an autogenous biologic? Well, these are custom vaccines consisting of herd-specific antigens. And yes, these are made for cervid. So you're getting a cervid vaccine with the specific bacteria that you're finding uh, through sampling and diagnostics. You can't find a, a better way to protect these animals. So the results of adding um, just this product showed tremendous improvement in the overall uh, mortality rates we were experiencing, though that morbidity, basically how many antibiotics we needed to administer to sick animals, re remained above our threshold, right? So over the course of the next 10 years, we kind of called, we reduced our imports of new animals into the herd, we put in quarantine protocols uh, when we did have new animals enter. Uh, and then we kind of continued this twice a year uh, vaccine program and administration. And we finally implemented strict pillar one adherence. Remember what pillar one was? Yep, pen density. The result of that has been outstanding. I wish I would have started with that great base of pillar one prior to pillar two that's not how my story goes. So, um, you know, it wasn't until after I saw those improvements and I kind of just was doing reviews of my farm over and over and over and said, you know, what am I missing? What am I missing? Boom, pillar one, pen density. Um, and then everything started changing. So we got those two pillars knocked out. The third one, and I've said this before, um, pillar three is nutrition. I've taken this for granted. Um, and, and as I write in the article, I'm jaded discussing uh, nutrition as a topic, uh, simply for the fact that my feed program has been unchanged for 15 years. Um, the quality of the feed we have is top grade. And the most important part is it is consistent. When I order a batch of feed, I order in bulk from the same place that I've been ordering from uh, for a long, long time. And that feed shows up and it's, it's the same every time, you know, we do, we do random testing. Obviously we get our uh, minimum value tags, but like the mill is just spot on. Um, so that's a big part of what I think is important in feed. Uh, we can, you know, you can talk about formulations, and all that. We're not going to do that here today, but consistency is, is really important. That gives you a nice stable uh, platform to work from. Uh, what we do know is the white-tailed deer is incredibly adaptive to many environments and feed types, um, and, and really a true success story in and of themselves in New York, or New York, yeah, New York, um, North America. We have present populations today around 35 million white-tailed deer in the United States, 35 million. You know, just a few, uh, you know, 100 years ago, um, that number was really, really small. So the white-tailed deer can and does have specific nutritional requirements to thrive. However, you know, as we involve ourselves into that kind of uh, management and, and nutritional requirement, you know, people just look at it and say, hey, more is better, right? 20% proteins, 12% fats, uh, and so on. So my general suggestion about feed is really simple. It's keep it simple, balanced, and buy the best you can. If you look at your balance sheet at the end of the year and you look at all those different expenses that you have outside of labor, and, and I'll, I'll, I jokingly say this, who, who's, who's, who's paying people on their farm for payroll, right? So payroll is always your, your largest expense pretty much. Um, 
feed is the largest input we have, right? It's um, it, it's just it's it's a monster for even a small number of animals. These guys eat, and uh, if you're feeding some, you know, pretty good feed, it's expensive, right? So, uh, it it really plays a key role in in herd health. Uh, it's a foundational item. Uh, an input and it sets the stage for genetic expression and health. So kind of to wrap up in hindsight, I wish these uh, pillars were implemented into my day-to-day -day operation a long time ago. And, and really, if they were all at the same time, that would be great. Um, but I wanted to share them with you today. I think it, it you know, provides me great optimism for the future of the servant industry. So that's the that's the uh, kind of part one of the, the pillars of success. You can read the, the whole article in uh, the deer tracking mag. Oh, excuse me. But I think when we, when we look at those things, they're pretty simple things to implement, right? So you look at feed and you say, there's some commercial feeds avail available that have widespread distribution. And um, while they may be expensive or, you know, quote unquote, out of your budget, um, they provide a pretty good nutritional quality and content. Um, you know, if you have a local mill, you may consider a custom uh, feed. You just, you got to find a nutritionist that knows what they're doing. Um, my experience is nutritionists for deer are kind of, few and far between um, and most of the good ones are kind of scooped up by the the large companies but there are some there are some good ones out there and um, that's something to consider uh, feed takes a long time to develop as as far as a custom ration goes um, you can get it pretty close but you have to you know as you make changes they have to be kind of limiting and incremental and it takes time for those animals to adapt so you can look at you can look at kind of growth rates, but you have to have some sort of metrics. So scales are important as far as you know body weights go. Then there's the genetic component that you have to consider, and there's just there's a lot of you know there's a lot of things you can look at reproduction, like how many fawns are these guys giving out uh, per year on the doe side, how much antler growth are you getting, and it's it's a it, you can get really in depth and it can get really complicated. Um, and it's, it's kind of tough to have a baseline to work from, but I think that there's, there's enough good quality feeds out there that, um, provide adequate nutrition. I, I've seen, um, you know, 400 inches of antler grown on, uh, 12% protein. Uh, now I don't think that's ideal. And, you know, can we say that that animal would have expressed more inches of antler growth if, you know, he was on a, a higher protein feed and, you know, other things in there, not that protein's the, the uh, most important, but uh, it just shows that these animals are, are really adaptive and a, a good, you know, basic, basic feed is going to, going to get the job done. I think that there's enough, uh, enough instances of people posting pictures of really, really nice deer, nice looking deer. And you know, they, they are like, Hey, I'm just feeding a sweet feed for horses. Right. Um, I, I'm not personally into doing that. Like I like a deer specific feed, but if those animals are performing and, and, you know, you think the overall health of them is, is good and you're meeting your performance goals and standards, then have at it. Right. Um, so that's kind of the, that's the nutritional uh, side of things. And again, I'm not a nutritionist. I, I actually, I know very little about feed. Uh, I, I, I just take for granted that we have good feed and I try to forget about it. Right. I just make sure that it gets mixed the same every time that I'm feeding them, you know, pretty much, uh, on the same schedule, et cetera. And they eat the feed and they seem to do well. Um, on the, uh, on the pen density front, like, it's like, yo, get less animals, right? That's such a simple concept. Um, now there are economic factors that, that uh, play a part of that. And I, I've started having more of these discussions. At the end of the day, it's, 
you know, what is your, what is your land consideration? Um, you know, kind of what's your overall business plan? How many of these uh, animals do you need to raise or do you need to sell is a better, better way to look at it um, to, you know, meet your, uh, meet your needs economically or financially. Uh, and you do that on the piece of property you have. And then, you know, how far, how far can you push things from a animal number side till you get some sort of event or collapse, right? So I think I, I talked about this, but like we're generally having a, um, a pretty mild winter. Now uh, I'm looking outside, it's snowing. I like snow, I've stated this many times. I don't like, um, you know, Greg Leonard's South Dakota um, uh, quantities of snow, at least from this year. But I like snow cover throughout the winter. Uh, we haven't had it. So my pastures have been challenged. Now, I'm fortunate that I have my animal numbers pretty low for wintering that my pastures aren't beat too much. Now, I'm starting to see the signs of that. You know, it's what are we at? It's, you know, middle of March anyway. And of course, the edges get beat up because those deer walk around the, the fence. Um and the, the trails are getting worked down. You know, there's no there's no photosynthesis happening right now. Nothing's growing. Everything's dormant. You know, this is not a southern climate where I live. Uh, we have winter. Things die off. And it, it has to get warmer for any type of regeneration to happen. So what you have going into fall is what's going to be there all, all winter. Uh, if you go into fall overcrowded and things are beat up and muddy, well, you know, it's going to be a mess throughout the winter. And that's hard on animals. When those animals lay on bare ground, um, that's hard on them. When they lay on bare ground with no thatch or vegetation, that's hard on them. So those are things to, to consider. You know, I'm, I am trying to, you know, prepare for the worst, you know, kind of hope for the best. So, you know, my preparation is I'm, I'm hoping that I look at my animal numbers and I say that they can handle these extreme events with the number of animals that are in specific pastures. And if those events don't come, those animals can continue to thrive. But I want them to be able to thrive in those, even those worst conditions. Like they are, they are pretty robust animals. You know, I, I joked around, um, I joked around a lot, like, you know, living like these whitetails that are living every day to die or trying to find a corner to die in. And like, I just kind of moving away from that sort of rhetoric um, to say that, you know, these, these animals are, are robust and when uh, well cared for and well maintained, there's not much that gets them down. So, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll give you an example. I had a, a buck that I saw maybe a week ago now and he just kind of looked a little off didn't really know what was up and so I kind of went over I got him up he had separated himself um from the group which obviously is always a, a, a kind of telltale sign it could have just been the time of day but anyway I was like I'm gonna go over and check him out and I went over and he had some loose stool so I kind of working around the pen working around the pen and I you know I found a, a cow flop if you will so you know, you could see just uh, where the brown hair meets the the white on his his rump. Um, you could see some feces kind of hanging off there. And you know, after inspecting the the cow pie, there's some irritation there, a little bit of mucus. There's some kind of blood streak through there. And he just, you know, sometimes they outside of the the blood, uh, sometimes they get loose stool, but not in the winter, uh, just because their their diet is like. It, it, it's not conducive to loose stool, right? You could see that in the summer or in the heat, but like in the winter here in the North, um, you know, generally speaking, it's cold all the time. They're chewing bark off of trees and eating leaves. And yes, they eat hard feed, but it's in small quantities. You know, if these guys are eating, you know, one to two pounds a day as a, a, a maintenance on the, you know, the hard feed, that's probably about normal. They get their hay. Um, so anyway, I just decided to sedate him and I, uh, I gave him some treatment, um, that I thought would be helpful for, you know, enteric bacteria or, you know, uh, intestinal bacteria. Um, gave him a little bit of wormer, 
uh, ran some fluids through him just to kind of tune him up vitamins etc and then you know when when he was uh waking up we we gave some um probiotic paste from cna to him so gave him a whole tube of uh, fawn paste and then i gave him uh, a big tube of electromax and you know within and, and I, you know i kind of cleaned his rump up a little bit um within you know the first day he had uh three more loose stools so that was um we moved him either saturday or sunday today's a friday so i think uh Wednesday or so Wednesday Thursday yep uh Thursday I couldn't I I can't distinguish his uh fecal material from the other one we we moved him so we could monitor him closely um and then uh you know he seems you know great again so there was a there was a an incidence where in my opinion you know bear pens for long periods of time um you know those those pastures get beat down and you know he's just picking at other deer's you know poop or whatever and um you know he got sick now i don't know exactly what caused that but my my general protocol for you know adult deer with uh loose stools like that is is you know pretty simple and basic and uh, typically it works so he's all cleaned up, back to go. He's I see him in the feeder. I see him chewing his cud, right? And so he's acting like a normal deer. I'm going to slide him right back in that pen and, you know, I'll keep an eye on him, but he's fine. So, you know, that stuff happens. Um, now, what happens if there were, you know, I got, I don't know, he's in the pen with 10 bucks. It's two acres. Um, they got plenty of room. I don't know, like, what happens if there's 20 bucks in there? Do you know, do I have to do that two, three, four times? Um, I, I just don't like handling my deer that much if I don't have to. Uh, I certainly don't like, you know, having to sling darts at them. Um, I just, it's, it's not something I'm into anymore. I don't want to work that hard at this. I want to enjoy these animals. I want to go out and feed. I want to do my health checks. And, you know, when I focus on health, it, it's, yes, it's for adult deer, but like it's, it's for fawns. Like I will spend time making sure my fawns are healthy because, you know, the likelihood that they get sick is much, much higher than, you know, an adult deer, but you know, we've got that kind of diet or, you know, knock on wood. Right. Um, cause there is some luck involved in this game, but like we got that dialed in pretty good too. Um, it's just rare that I have to do anything with these fawns. So Pen density is important. Of course, I said I was going to do a separate show. I feel like I'm doing that now. Um, anyway, the vaccines, if you want to know, um, you know, any additional info on, on vaccines, I'm going to link a card right there. Um, and you can watch a whole show. The last show we did was on that. So check out that show. We cover, um, you know, all the phony, uh, all the uh, protocols, the general protocols for the vaccines and some of the rationale uh, prior to spring. So um, I hope you enjoyed this, this show and, and it was uh, somewhat meaningful for you as far as like how we look at the really basic things, you know, set yourself up for success by, you know, really looking at these, these three things. Um, I'm going to kind of think about some of this more and uh, I will share those, those thoughts with you. Also, you know, take me up on, on my offer. If you, um, if you know somebody or have somebody that you think would like to come on the show, I really enjoy talking to other folks. I think it's um, great for those that are watching or listening to hear other people's perspectives and, you know, listen to some folks chat. Uh, we do have the Nadifa conference coming up. Uh, if you're going, come say hi. I will be there um, thinking about doing some interviews in the booth. Uh, just kind of a, a short, you know, maybe 15, 20 minute chat with somebody. Uh, so check that out. I think we'll wrap up there. And with that, stay tuned for another episode of North American Deer Talk.